started. I think I had my volume turned down all the way. And my tablet is giving me some sort of issues too. Hang on one second. All right, so uh, last, last lecture, new material before the midterm, uh, and it is fairly short. Um, we're not adding a, I'm holding off on adding a bunch of the reactions for acid derivatives, and we'll, we'll pick up with that after the midterm. It'll be um, a bit of a review after the midterm. My tablet has apparently forgotten all of my login information for my network. So I'm trying to get that connected while I'm talking to you. Um, there we go. That should work. All right. Um, so we're basically going to be talking about the relative stabilities of these various acid derivatives um, because that's going to set the table. Um, for the, the primary reactions that we see of acid derivatives are either things we've mostly seen already, like reduction reactions with aluminum, um, lithium aluminum hydride, or um, just converting back and forth between the more reactive acid derivatives to the, make the less reactive acid derivatives, um, which is essentially what peptide bond formation is. So remember, a peptide bond is is what links together amino acids in proteins. And it's basically just reacting an amine with a carboxylic acid to make an amide, which is the most stable form of these acid derivatives, um, which is why your proteins don't spontaneously disconnect each other, because you're making the most stable functional group out of this category. Um, so basically, the, the main reactions we're going to see with these acid derivatives um, after the midterm are going to be those uh, converting back and forth between them, um, which really doesn't take too much. Um, there. So let's, let's go ahead and get started. First off, does anybody have any, so keeping in mind, we're going to have a review session on Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, morning. Does anybody have any parts of the practice test that they had any questions about so far? Yes, I do. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering if we can go over um, section two, number one. And I'm struggling. I'm just having a hard time trying to decide on where I want for that first reaction, where I want it to connect, where I want the bond to be placed. And then... Right. Yeah, let me let me get that open in my PDF viewer instead of the browser so I can move around better. Um, you said section two, number one. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have two different um, substituents on a benzene ring, and we've got a reactive um, acyl group. We've got an acid chloride um, with a Lewis acid, which means we're going to be adding that ketone is going to be connecting directly to the benzene ring somewhere. Um, so the the key with these is if you have two substituents on the same benzene ring, there are two possibilities. Either they're going to work together and pick and give you a couple options that that um, coexist. What's the word I'm looking for? Um, that work together that satisfies both of the substituents, or if they're competing like they are in this case, you go with whatever's the stronger activator. The stronger activator is going to control where everything else goes. So in this case, bromine and the methyl group are both OP directors, um, but the methyl group is an activator and halogens are a mild deactivator. 
So the, the methyl group is going to control where to put our new substituent. So it, and since it can't go in the para position, the only option is to put it in the uh, ortho position. So after step one, we're going to wind up with. And so is that on like your master cheat sheet? Because I was trying to look at um, like para ortho. I was looking at those and like I couldn't find this molecule. So. So we're going to wind up with, let me finish drawing this. I, it was in the textbook at some point, And I know we went over it in, um, in lecture as well. So um, let me double check. Well, I'll double check at uh, at break exactly where that is. Um, or actually, while you guys are thinking of other questions, uh, what am I doing? There we go. So we'd wind up starting with that would be our first molecule. Um, yeah, I believe it was in the textbook. Back, it would be back in chapter 18. Uh, multiple substituents. Oh, here. Uh, yeah, I think it's going to be in this section here. In some cases, they reinforce each other. In, in other cases, directing effects of various substituents may compete with each other. In such cases, the more powerful activating group dominates the directing effects. So you just need to go to that, um, that list of which directing groups go where, this table right here. The further it is towards the top here, the more it controls what's going to happen. Um, because the strongest activators are at the top here and the strongest deactivators are at the bottom. All right, so that's the multiple substituents one is on page 815. If you have a print copy, it's the PDF, it's on um, page 835. That answer your question, Elke? Um, yeah, I don't have the textbook, so that's probably why I wasn't able to figure it out. Yeah, um, in that case, check the um, check the slides where we were talking about ortho para directors, and I, I think there was a slide in there too. All right, anybody anybody else have anything for the practice test they want to go over so far? All right, then keep in mind that um, um, Tuesday is just going to be. First off, do we want a full two hours on Tuesday for a review session, or do we want to sleep in a little bit? Um, maybe start lecture at 8.30. Is anybody opposed to that? You mean Thursday? What did I say? Tuesday. But oh, yes. yeah. <laughs> Clearly, I could use the, the time to sleep in a little bit. Um, if there's I've, if anybody wants the full two hours to review, I have no problem being here at eight on Thursday. But if everybody's, you know, groggy eyed and and waking up at for an eight o'clock lecture is uh, um, not conducive to you getting enough sleep to do well on the test, it might be better to take the extra half an hour and uh, full two hours. I take the full two hours. <laughs> I need it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, in in. In that case, just remember that the review will be recorded and uh, also it will be, um, and the, the review is um, optional. So if you need those extra two hours to sleep to do better on the test, by all means do that. Um, yeah, let's talk about the due dates for this. So make sure that, so Canvas is a little bit weird the way that, um, the way that it does due dates. And last year I had an as an assignment that I thought I unpublished. So you guys couldn't see ex the old exam one now. Yeah. So um, you're looking at exam one that's going to be under the quizzes section. And I don't let's let's see the way it shows up for you. Um, if you're looking at your 
upcoming assignments. It'll be exam one. Um, and it'll be due on, yeah, uh, due on Sunday at midnight. Um, but I didn't change the due date on the other one. So it said today at some point. Um, I got rid of that one. So now it should just say exam one. Um, it'll say due at May 16th at midnight. Um, and I haven't fully written the test yet, but the instructions um, are, are here. So I can show you guys those. Um, I'm gonna give you the PDF and there'll probably be a couple different versions of it just to make sure I'm covering my bases as far as people not sharing answers with each other. Um, not that I expect you guys to do that, but it's just a huge pain in the ass if I have to deal with paperwork of, of uh, academic dishonesty stuff. So to cover your bases and make it less tempting for you, I'm going to probably have a few different versions of it and you won't have a, be able to, wait, a, to uh, tell which version you have. Um, it is open book and open note, but you may not work with other people. And that includes Chegg, that includes posting things online, that includes tutors. Um, and really, um, if I paste the test right, you won't have time to do any of that um, because it's going to be a pretty quick test um, because I wanted to encourage you to study before you take the test and not just count on being it being open note so you'll be able to look up the answers as you go. You should still review your, your stuff um, so that you're ready for it so that you can finish the test in the two hours that you have. Um, so it's due Sunday at midnight. If that doesn't work for you, um, timing wise, talk to me and we can work something out if, if need be. But I think everybody giving everybody from Thursday morning until Sunday at midnight works for everybody's schedule. Um, and then you'll just have a PDF. Don't have to print it. You can do it on binder paper. That's totally fine. Um, and you're just gonna submit your answers, preferably as a PDF at the end, just like with the quizzes. Um, Any questions about the formatting of the way it's structured or due dates? Adam, did I answer your question? Oh, so practice, I have the practice set to be due midnight, um, mostly because I don't want you to still have that hanging over your head while you're worried about taking the test itself. So ideally you will have finished the practice test um, or at least be you know a good chunk of the way through it when you come to the review on Thursday or at least by the end of, of um, business on Thursday so that you're ready for the test. Um, if you need the extra time, if you don't have time to finish the practice test between now and then, um, I can extend that deadline. That was just my initial thinking. So just let me know privately if you want, um, if you need the, the weekend to finish the practice test too. Uh, I just don't wanna pile up too many deadlines on you. All right. Yeah, I've noticed in my in my intro to Chem class and Chem 100, which must seem like a very long time ago for you guys, um, that uh, they they have like three deadlines a week. They have a homework assignment, a virtual lab, and a quiz every week. And if if students get one week behind, then it just starts piling up, and they've got seven deadlines outstanding at 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 the same time. And it's really hard for people to recover when you've got that because it just seems overwhelming. Um, so you guys have fewer deadlines because you're more advanced students, um, but I still want to be careful and not uh, not swamp you that way. Hmm. So, Sean, for lab today, we're going to be talking about the research project. Yes. Speaking of other deadlines that I'm piling on top of you. Um, yes, it won't be due until next Tuesday, so you can do it. I would. Um, either use working on that as sort of a study break while you're getting ready for the test or when you're done with the test. Um, I would tackle that one because it's just find four papers. Uh, and like I said, we'll talk about this in lab today and, and you'll have lab time today to work on it. Um, but yeah, that's, that'll be due next Tuesday. Um, so you'll actually be, um, you'll be able to do that over the weekend and it, it really shouldn't be i've got a couple good links um and as long as we can get you guys access um and that's probably the, a good goal to by the end of lab today if you haven't had time to actually find four 
potential papers. Um, at the very least, make sure that with at your house or wherever you are, um, that you have access to the databases so that you can look up papers um, so that you're not struggling with trying to get access on Sunday night after you've taken the test and get frustrated with it. Um, <clears throat> so we'll, like I said, we'll work on that in lab today. Um, and it should be fairly fun. You guys have enough tools at this point that you can understand just about um, any of the OCHEM related abstracts that we're going that you'll find. Um, it'll still take some some time and effort, but at the same time, you shouldn't run into a brick wall like you did in the fall when you hit a paper that was just too advanced. Those those papers, um, you shouldn't run into any of those papers anymore because you have the tools to be able to understand all the OCHEM stuff even if we haven't exactly covered it or if it's a little bit more advanced, so. All right. Any other, any other logistics timeline exam, um, exam, practice exam questions for now? Cool. Then let's do some review. Let's practice some some nomenclature for um, for these acid derivatives. Um, remind yourself of what the names of that type of functional group are, and uh, and there's the one common name um, oxalate. Um, I'll just throw that one up there. Um, oxalic acid is. The IUPAC name for that would be ethane dioic acid. So just two carbons attached in your main carbon group, and each one of them is a carboxylic acid. So it's just two carboxylic acids back to back. Um, and I think that's the only one that we need for the rest of these. Um, all right, so I'll give you a few minutes to work on these, and then we'll go through them. They call him again, and he's just like... All right, let's look at these first two. So dimethyl oxalate, IOPAC name would be dimethyl ethane dioate. So oxalic acid is just 
two carbons. That are each um, a carboxylic acid. So if it's dimethyl oxalate, then it's that means it's a diester. And we're going to replace both of the H's with a methyl group. And so that would be our, our structure. So remember for, for esters, you name them like they're the deprotonated form of the acid. So turn the ic acid into an eight. So again, back from gen chem, nitric acid would be nitrate when it's deprotonated. Um, so any carboxylic acid, that's deprotonated, you do the same thing. And if you put a branch name on in front of that as a separate word, that means that you're saying it's an ester, meaning that you have another carbon group on the other side of that oxygen. Um, N-methyl propionamide, remember propionamide, propionic acid was just the um, common name pro, propane, propan, propanamide would be the IUPAC version of that, close enough that it's not really that tricky to remember. Um, so three carbons in a row, one, two, three. And an amide is always a carbonyl next to a nitrogen. And so if it's N-methyl propionamide, that just means our methyl groups attached to the nitrogen. All right, if we're looking at some of these other, then we're trying to come up with the name for them. Um, so might be worth remembering, let me find the section on the textbook where it talks about the cyclo groups um, for these to make sure that I can, I say it the same way that they do. So for, if it's a carboxylic acid, we just say the name of the alkane, and then we just say the word carboxylic acid. So for this, for A, it would just be cyclopentane carboxylic acid. Um, you may also hear it use the uh, prefix carboxy, a carboxy or carbo bleh, a carboxyl group is a carboxylic acid it, when you use it as a prefix. So you could either say carboxo, carboxyl cyclopentane or cyclopentane um, carboxylic acid. Right, so not too tricky with these. And where are the, there we think they are. And so for the acid derivatives, it's gonna go more or less the same way. Um, anytime you've got them attached to a, to a pentane or a, a um, alkyl group, you're basically just going to refer to it as um, the amide or the chloride. So for B, it would just be cyclopentane 
again, let me make sure that I'm um, carboxamide, cyclopentane carboxamide. You're just dropping the ic acid and replacing it with amide. Um, and in general, if it's if it's not one of these one of these exceptions where you have a ring that has functional group directly attached to it, um, all of our normal rules for find your longest continuous carbon chain with that group, um, and then use the suffix to name it still apply. So C would wind up being instead of benzoic acid, if it had the OH instead of the chlorine, it would be benzoic acid. If it's an acyl hydride or halide, you just drop the ic acid and you put YL as though it was a branch um, and, and uh, chloride or bromide, if it's a bromide. So this would be benzoyl chloride. You drop, so if we start with benzoic acid, you're gonna drop the IC and replace it with YL. So it becomes benzoyl chloride. You can wind up with some that look some names that look pretty odd. Um, looks looks a bit like it might be a, a Yiddish chemistry term um, to me. But then again, I see connections to other languages where they aren't necessarily there. Um, but that's that's our rule, even if it makes uh, gives us a name that looks a little bit odd. So you wind up with OYL a lot with these with these acid chlorides. Any questions on those first three? I must just be thinking, I don't know very much Yiddish. I must just be thinking of, of uh, the, the Moyle, right? Is the, is the person who does the bris, is that right? All right. If we're naming an ester, <laughs> Father Benzoil. <laughs> um, if we're naming an ester, Name the acid side first. And then you're just gonna name the other side as a branch, right? So this would be acetic acid or ethanoic acid. We name it as the deprotonated form. So it'd be um, the base molecule would be ethanoate. Or if you're using common name, you could call it acetate. It means the same thing as ethanoate. And then we've got an ethyl group on the other side. So as a separate word, ethyl ethanoate or ethyl acetate would be this molecule. If we've got a longer carbon chain, and if you can recognize from the um, from the condensed structure that it is a, an acid group, so CO2H is an acid group. So we just need to count our longest car uh, continuous carbon chain. So one for the methyl at the end, then four in a row, so that's five. Then the last carbon that's part of the acid group. So that would be a total of six. So this would be hexanoic acid.
So, and some of these, again, some of these will look a little bit funny in the condensed structure, but generally there's only one functional group that we know that could fit with these. So it looks a little bit odd, this CONH2, but the only functional group that that could be is an amide, right? So the, everything else is the same as E, so we'd wind up with um, hexanamide. So take the hexanoic acid, get rid of the oic acid, and replace it with amide. Right, so we're adding some volume with all of these new functional groups. But once you get the hang of what they're all called, naming them is not too tricky, especially if you have that cheat sheet in front of you from compound chemistry is really helpful for this one. Um, I found I found that to be the case anyway. Which is the which I believe is posted, but let me. Um, I'm not sure about that. Um, it's the one that looks like. This right because it's got. It's got most pretty much all of the functional groups we've covered so far, plus a couple new ones. We haven't talked about azides um, or isocyanates, but the rest of these, this is a pretty good, um, a pretty good overview of the functional groups we've covered so far, right? And the ones in green are the ones that we've added this in this last chapter last two chapters because aldehydes and ketones are over here too right so this would be a pretty good thing or at least rewrite it however it works for you but have some sort of a cheat sheet for nomenclature would be really helpful unless you're just feeling really confident about it and that you've got all these functional groups down um and i frankly i still would probably make make myself a um a table or something um to sort of keep my thoughts organized so that if I do have a panic moment on the test that it's not gonna cost me any points because I have this ready to go. Um, D, we named F four carbons in a row, and then it's in um, a, an acyl chloride. So it's would be butanoyl chloride. The butanoic acid, if it was the acid, or we're gonna drop, or sorry, there's five of them, the methyl, then three CH2s, and then next one. So it'd be um, pentanoic acid if it was the acid. If you drop the ick um, and put YL chloride, you get pentanoyl chloride. Um, sometimes, and I'm not gonna be picky about this. Um, people will drop the O as well, so it'd be pentanyl chloride. Um, and I believe even Molview will show up with that. So if you type in pentanoil, um, you get everything showing up here. Let's see what happens if you get rid of the O. I guess it doesn't show up as well. Um, so keeping the O is is preferable. So there's our pentanoic chloride that we have the condensed structure for over here. Um, these ones at the bottom all have common names. But they also have systematic names as well. Um, remember, if you have two, what looks like two acid groups linked at the, at the oxygen, that's not an ester or an acid anymore. That's an acid anhydride. So you name it just like it's the acid, just instead of saying the word acid, you say anhydride. 
So this would be acetic acid or ethanoic acid. So if we're naming it as the anhydride, it would be Um, and I'm actually a little bit surprised now that I'm thinking about it that we didn't, I guess we hadn't talked about acid um, and hydrides yet, um, but this is actually another way to add, to do in um, Friedel Crafts acylation is to use an anhydride because you have such a good leaving group. So if that's your leaving group, what's left, just like when we had, um, the acid chlorides and with a with a Lewis acid that made them um, very pretty good electrophiles. This carbon right here winds up being a pretty good electrophile. So this is actually one of the ways that you can make aspirin. One of the first synthesis labs that we generally do in OCHEM is making aspirin. You guys did that that fake virtual version of it. It might have been last quarter at this point where you had to optimize some concentrations and things like that. Um, this is going to basically do the same electrophilic substitution um, that we've that we saw back in chapter 17, 18, um, as the as the ACL chloride would, because acid anhydrides are just as reactive, um, almost as reactive as the acid chlorides. And acetic anhydride has very, very distinct smell. Um, it smells like it smells like um, vinegar and burning skin um, because it it uh, reacts with the moisture in the air to make acetic acid molecules. Um, but some of them stay as the acetic anhydride, and it actually does sort of burn your nostrils a little bit. It stings um, even more extreme than than pure acetic acid does. Um, so I, I also describe it as the smells like the strongest vinegar you've ever smelled in your life. And little tidbits like this are why most, um, most chemists do not have a great sense of smell after a few years of working in a lab. Um, I had a, a professor when I was an undergrad who had zero sense of smell. He'd worked in an, in an inorganic lab for so long with such harsh chemicals that he could literally not smell anything, um, which was really, really, I TA'd for him one quarter. And it was very, very interesting to uh, be in a lab with a person who has no sense of smell because he couldn't smell if the gas spigots were linking. He couldn't smell if somebody spilled something in the back of the room. Um, so just occupational hazards being a chemist. Watch out for the inorganic chemists. They, they just tend to be the nastiest stuff to work with. Um, benzene ring with a acid group. Remember, we're just, it's technically an irregular name or a common name, but it's just, we're just going to name it um, with that prefix B E N Z. So it's just benzoic acid. Just like with aldehyde, it was benzaldehyde. Um, if it was an amide there, it'd be benzamide. Right. So we just use that as our prefix, which is technically an irregular, but it still makes a lot of sense. Um, a single carbon group, you can name that with the prefix form or meth. So you could name this methanoic acid. The common name would be formic acid. So bends, form. Um, and then this one is one that I'm not going to actually test you on anything, but it does show up occasionally be oxalic. Um, and that, I think that might have actually been one of the um, polyatomic ions I had you memorize back in Gen Chem. Did we have to memorize the formula for oxalate? C2O4 with a negative two charge. B oxalate would be the deprotonated form of this, right? So it may not have been on our list of things to memorize, um, but acetate and oxalate do both show up as 
um, common names still fairly often. Uh, and then the one that I zoomed in to the point where we can't see it anymore. Remember, if it's two carbons, it's an um, acetate or acetic acid or acetic anhydride or acetyl chloride. And so those are the, the three common prefixes that we see all the time. Form, bends, and a seat. Beyond that, I don't care if you memorize common names, but those ones are ones you probably want to have down because they show up all over the place still. All right, nomenclature questions. Any weird exceptions that you've thought about that we haven't covered yet? Usually you come up with those when you're studying. Um, not necessarily the first thing to come up, but any any what if questions now would be an appropriate place to ask them. Um, and I suppose I can one that I've probably uh, said this to you enough times. Um, if you have multiple functional groups on the same molecule, um, you're generally just going to have to name one of them with a prefix. Um, and so, and there's a list of common prefixes, for instance. So if I had an OH on here, um, and actually that's a bad one to use in this, as an example, considering it's already somewhat a, an exception. Um, so we had propanoic acid that also had an alcohol. We would name that as propanoic acid, and then we would say that the OH is there as a as a prefix. And there's a list of prefixes in the textbook in the uh, in the appendix. And the only appendix on here is a is yeah a nomenclature polyfunctional compounds. And so there's basically a list of um. There we go. If you name it as a suffix versus if you name it as a branch. So an alcohol, we name as a hydroxy group if we're naming it as a as a prefix. I'm not going to ask you about this on the test per se, um, but just so you're aware that there is sort of a hierarchy of, um, you know, still follows our rule of name the parent molecule and then name whatever else is there with a prefix. Hmm. All right, so this would be three hydroxy propanoic acid. And just as a, yeah. And so this actually, this is actually a really helpful table as well. If you ever have to do any of those um, multiple functional groups, because this also has the priority. If it's closer to the top, then you name it as the suffix. If it's closer to the bottom, then you're more likely to name it as the branch, as the substituent. So ethers, amines, and alcohols, if you have anything, any other functional groups in there, the other functional groups take priority and you name it as, use the suffix name for them. And the, the functional group that's closer to the bottom gets named as the substituent. All right. Let's go ahead and take our break there, break here. Um, and then we'll get into new stuff in uh, 
let's see got don't have that many slides left today so let's go ahead. we can take a, a little bit longer break let's come back at nine and we will get into the new material It's still looking like uh, you guys are going to open up the chemistry lab this next uh, year. Yeah, it's looking it's looking very good. We still might be at slightly reduced capacity um, as far as some some of the classes go. Since, um, but the 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 um, chem lab will be actually next year is going to be really interesting because we're supposed to start renovating the whole campus next year. Um, so they're actually scheduled to demolish the uh, the chemistry lab in the winter quarter. So starting on in January. Um, so we'll have one quarter back in our normal labs for the fall, and then we'll be out and um, they're going to bring us up 
um, some fume hoods and uh, eye washes out in the portable buildings out by the parking lot. Um, the the one that used to have a spin class in it um, that had uh, it's a PE building. I think they're going to take that and turn that into our makeshift chemistry lab for a year um, while we get total, all new labs um, built, which will be nice to have all new labs and have everything working again. But means that uh, we're just going to have another weird year next year. Um, yeah, but at least. Yeah, it's exciting. They're getting some new stuff. Are you going to get some new equipment, like a GC or something? Well, we actually have a GC, just a really small one. Um, it's fairly limited as to what we can put through it. We can't put like essential oils or anything through it because it can only do things that boil below like 150 Celsius, I think like that or something like that. Um, but, uh, we have a GC and technically this is all being paid for by, by, um, with bond money that's only allowed to renovate the, the, um, classrooms themselves, the building itself. We're not allowed to use any of it to buy stuff. Um, so the way I've heard it explained to me is that, um, if some, if you picked up the lab, um, like it was a shoebox and turned it upside down, anything that would move around or fall out um, is not covered by this. So I don't even think we get furniture, like chairs, bench, bench stools covered, um, but it'll free up a lot of money elsewhere for us to buy stuff like that. And we're trying to get an IR with some of the money we've saved this year. Um, but uh, yeah, NMR is probably out of reach, but you never know. Um, yeah, we're probably are just gonna have to, to write some grants and get some funding that way because, um, you know, the way our funding works, if you don't use it, then it gets used. We have to use all of our funding every year with the exception of the bond money. Um, so it's not like we can save the money that we saved in the chemistry department this year and then add to that next year and save up for a big piece of the instrument. Um, we're because and it's going to go to some other part of the school that needs money this year we're not allowed to carry it over um so that kind of limits since our whole budget for the year is like six thousand dollars a year um for chemicals and, and equipment and an nmr costs about 50 grand um we're probably never going to get an nmr um but we're hope hoping we're able to get some quotes back for an IR that's reasonable enough that with the money we've saved this year, we could actually afford it. Um, but those go up to like 25 grand a piece too, if you get the, the research quality ones. So we'll see, we have to write some grants, get some money from other places. Yeah, it'd be nice to have that equipment. That would kind of bring it full circle. You can get pretty close to full circle doing synthesis and stuff, but it's kind of like, well, your melting point or Right, we're still limited to using a melting point, um, or if you're lucky, a GC to tell whether or not you made what you actually said you made. Um, but that's why we're not a research school, right? You know, we don't have as much money, but we also don't have the obligations to produce papers and and research, um, which takes away a lot from time to to teach. If you look at a at a research school for um, in the science departments, the the professors most of the time will teach maybe maybe one class a semester um, and probably not the lab for it either. They probably would have you know two lectures a week and the rest of their time is spent either is spent writing grants and um, trying to get money for their grad students to then use to um, do research. So um, it's uh, there are pluses and minuses to being at a community college. I get to teach a lot more, but I also don't have any of the tools um, for, for some of these other, other labs when it comes to this, which is why I just wind up giving you the spectra and interpreting it as though we were doing it ourselves. Yeah, I mean, it, at the beginner level, it's probably more beneficial to have, you know, more face-to-face -face time with kids and stuff rather than more equipment to let them use. Yeah, you guys are reaching that point where you're switching over. Um, if I think back to when I was in undergrad, 
my second year, they did teach us to use all of these this equipment and we would get our own NMRs and our own IRs um, and then have to interpret them. But I still didn't really know what we were doing. I wasn't allowed to touch any of the equipment without an older student there to sort of have guided anyway. So it's more about just the exposure to it. And that's not something that's hard to get moving forward um, as, a, as a junior instead of a sophomore student. Um, you'll still be able to have somebody there to show you how to use it the first time. So, um, and yeah, they were, they were supposed to do the planning process for, for the renovation this year. Um, and actually they're starting July 1st, as soon as the summer, as soon as the spring quarter is over, they're gonna start renovating parts of the school. Um, but the science labs are going to are sort of the second wave of that construction. So they're going to do a bunch of the faculty offices um, and a bunch of the classrooms um, starting July 1st and carrying through. I think the art department is getting totally redone too, um, starting July 1st and go. And that's supposed to take through December and then starting when that gets done. So we have place to put everybody. Then we will go, they'll start uh, tearing out the science labs in my office and, and uh, Kathy's office and stuff. Um, so it is still part of the plan. Um, they're just, the, these uh, bond money is very, very specific as to when you're allowed to spend money and on what. Um, so it's not like we just have this big bank account that we can dip into when we need it or whenever we're ready. Ideally, it would have been nice to do this last year um, during the pandemic when nobody was on campus anyway, but that's not the timeline that we had. So we're not allowed to do that. Lots of red tape. Yep. Yeah. And it's there for a reason because, you know, the, the bond money we got from, from taxpayers in El Dorado County saying that, that they're willing to pay higher property taxes to, to pay for this. So we have obligation to make sure we're being efficient with that. And the red tape is there to make sure that's the case, that we're using it for what we said we were going to use it for. And then we're, we're doubly restricted because we were able to double that money um, by applying for a program that the state runs. That's They call it the remodel for efficiency, which basically means having more people, uh, having less empty classrooms. Um, so since we actually qualified because we had enough empty, our school is too big spatially for the number of students. So they're going to give us money to redesign it in a way that we have less empty space um, at any given time. And so that allows us to double our money, but it also means we're restricted as to what we can spend it on again. Um, so anything we spend the money on has to fit both of those projects, the bond and this remodel for efficiency. Um, which again, it doubles our money, gives us something close to $20 million to redo the school, but we have to be careful how we do it so that we don't have to pay it back to the state in a year or two. Anyway, let's go back to OCHEM here. Dr. Sean, I was curious, do you think, how long do you yeah. think that offer is gonna stand for us to sit in on the class? You think it'll last till like the following year? I mean, like if once the still labs around, are fixed, it um, might if be. You're still around, it's it's so the way that auditing works at uh, at at least at our community college. I can't speak to other other community colleges. Um, you're allowed to audit and not pay anything. So audit just means you're taking the class um, for free, but you don't get any units for it. Uh, and you're basically allowed to do that any time that there's room in a class. And so like you can't get you can't take up a spot in a class if there's a waiting list. But and this applies to any class as well. If you don't care if you want the get the units for it and you just want the experience or to learn the material, you can audit it and it's free as long as there's room in the class. Um, you know, and there's some restrictions. The instructor has to agree to it. You're not allowed to add extra grading for the instructor. So like you're not allowed to turn in any assignments and things like that. Um, depending on the um, on the instructor, but that's always an option. So that doesn't actually have a timeline on it. Um, so that's, and I don't, I'm not even sure if there's limits to that. As long as the class has the enrollment to run, you're allowed to audit it as long as you're not taking up somebody else's spot. 
Cool, thanks. Yeah, I mean, especially since you said it's going to be maybe limited, so that kind of made me think. The fall should be should be normal. So at least you you know if you just audited the the fall lab, it would be about like normal. And I'm I'm going to work really hard to make sure it's not. It's going to be a little bit weird for me, um, but the labs will be. I'm being very very pushy with the um, planning committee about making sure that we get everything um, that we need to do real OCHEM labs next year and not have to sort of piece it together. There'll be, so be a little bit of that on my end, but it'll have, it won't be that weird. It'll just be weird in that it's in a portable instead of our regular chem lab. All right. Let's talk about reactivity of these acid derivatives. Um, so basically, the way we determine how good of, or how reactive an acid derivative is, is by looking at the leaving group. The better the leaving group, the more reactive that compound is. So if we look at an acid chloride, the chloride is a really good leaving group. It's a very, very weak base. So with that in mind, acid chlorides are the most reactive acid derivative. Um, because that leaving group can leave so easily. And then it goes the acid anhydrides because your leaving group is a deprotonated acid, which is pretty stable. It's a pretty weak base. And then it goes esters and OHs, or esters and acids are about the same reactivity um, because a, this leaving group, the ROH leaving group is roughly the same um, strength of a base as, as hydroxide. Um, the alkoxide ions are maybe a little bit stronger of a base, but within sig figs for these log scales, they're, they're more or less the same. And then last but not least, our least reactive acid derivative is going to be the amide because the amide ion this NH2 with a negative charge is a very, very strong base. And so, and we do, it does say it has uh, esters as being more reactive than carboxylic acids on the list down below, despite the fact that they're about the same um, strength of the leaving group. And part of that though, is just that hydroxide is more common and their water is always around. Um, to some extent, and so we carboxylic acids wind up being favored just by virtue of the fact that you have more water um, and hydroxide around, generally speaking. <clears throat> um, and so what this really means is that if you have any molecule on the left-hand side, you can convert it into any of these others relatively easily. So from the acid chloride, you can make the acid anhydride, you can make the ester, you can make the acid, you can make an amide. Um, that, mean, that gives us a lot of good possibilities when it comes to synthesis. Um, making an ester is really a pretty straightforward process, uh, especially if you're starting from the acid chloride. Uh, and so they call this these reactions uh, nucleophilic acyl substitution. So it's still a nucleophilic substitution. And the mechanism looks a lot like our nucleophilic addition from the aldehydes and the ketones. But the difference is once you make this tetrahedral intermediate, so for aldehydes and ketones, when we had a nucleophile attack the carbonyl carbon right there, um, and you made this tetrahedral intermediate. For the aldehydes and ketones, there were no good leaving groups. So the next step was always just a proton transfer to add a H plus to your oxygen and turn it to an alcohol, right? Um, if you do have a good leaving group, like in this case, Z is the leaving group, 
believing group leaves and that gives space for this oxygen to reform the carbonyl group. So it's the same first step as our nucleophilic addition. We just then turn around and turn it back to being a carbonyl because we have a good leaving group. And so the, the weakest base or the best leaving group, you really, you have two options here for what your leaving group could be, right? Because most nucleophiles are also a decent leaving group because they tend to also be bases. Um, this reaction can happen in both directions and equilibrium is just going to favor making the molecule that has the strongest base still attached to the carbonyl. In other words, the, the um, best leaving group leaves. At, and that's going to be favored at equilibrium. But all of these reactions are going to be equilibrium reactions that can happen in both directions. And equilibrium favors the form where you're making the product that's further to the right. So if you have a carboxylic acid um, and an amide are your two possibilities, the amide is going to be favored at equilibrium. If you have carboxylic acid versus acid anhydride, carboxylic acid is favored at equilibrium. Right? Because it all has to do with how good of a leaving group you have attached. All right, so let's practice with this. For each of these three, predict what the product will be if the, your nucleophile attaches to the carbonyl group and your leaving group leaves, and then predict which side is going to be favored at equilibrium, meaning which one is making the more stable product. And I'll give you a few minutes to try that. All right, so for this first one, our nucleophile is a deprotonated acid. So we'd wind up with the, the mechanism would look something like this to make the intermediate. So you wind up with an intermediate that would look like
mist and oxygen in there. So our intermediate would look something like this. And then our leaving group would leave. And you remake that carbonyl bond. So our product would wind up looking like this. We wind up making the acid anhydride as our product and plus our leaving group. So instead of sodium, we had sodium propanoate as our reactant. Now we have sodium chloride as our byproduct. So which side of these would be favored at equilibrium? The anhydride, the, the acyl chloride is the most reactive. Yeah, acyl chloride is the most reactive. So acyl chloride with anything else, you're going to favor the product. So acid anhydrides are pretty reactive, but they're not as reactive as the acyl chlorides. So in that case, we'd favor at equilibrium, we would have more of the anhydride than we would the acyl chloride. Here we have an alcohol plus an acid. Um, and we have a catalytic hydrogen. We have a, acidic conditions, um, which can affect the mechanisms in a way we're, we're going to talk about here um, in a few minutes. But basically, we're going to wind up with our product that we could make here would be the methyl ester. So we would wind up making a methyl ester plus water. So at equilibrium, esters and acids were close to the same, same reactivity. So this would be one where we'd want to double check our, um, our chart here. It says esters are more reactive than carboxylic acids. So we would actually, we would favor the um, carboxylic acid side here, although these are close enough that by changing the conditions, if you had a way of removing water, or if you had a, um, a whole bunch of, of methanol, if you reacted this in pure methanol with no water around, you could get it to make this product pretty easily. Making an ester from an acid and an alcohol is something that's doable if we, if we use Le Chatelier's principle, and if we um, are careful about which reagents we use and how how good the quality is, um, we can make the esters relatively easy. But we would expect just the way this is written, the acid form is going to be the most common at equilibrium. Um, and in fact, that's actually, that is part of the reaction that they do that uh, you use to turn animal fats historically turning animal fats into soaps is this reaction basically it, it's the starting from the esters because the triglycerides that have all that um all the fat is stored as um, are a bunch of esters and if you expose that to either base or acid and water you wind up um making turning all of those esters into carboxylic acids so that's a that is just a version of this reaction going from what we have written as the products to the reactants out of curiosity i'm kind of curious if we put in triglyceride if it gives us anything 
kind of. You take each of these esters and make them longer. Turn them into long fatty acid chains. That's how the malt, that's how energy is stored as fat in your in your cells. And if you want to take these long fatty acid chains that are usually somewhere in the, like in the ballpark of 12 to 18 carbons long, if you want to take this molecule um, and turn it into a bunch of long fatty acid chains, you just expose it to base or acid and heat. And you wind up breaking all of these ester bonds and turning them into the acids and alcohols. All right, if we have any acid group and we're exposing it to ammonia as our nucleophile, we're going to take it and our nucleophile is the nitrogen here. So our product would wind up looking like the amide and here, we have the most reactive form and the least reactive form of acid derivatives. So at equilibrium, we're going to favor making the amide. All right, so again, the mechanism is not that tricky, although there are some wrinkles that we'll talk about here in a second. Um, and predicting which side is favored is just going to be based on, on how good of a leaving group you have. If it's a good leaving group, that means it's a more reactive molecule, and it's less likely to be favored at equilibrium. All right. So the I mentioned that there were some wrinkles here, and the number one wrinkle to consider is the fact that sometimes we need a proton transfer step based on the conditions. These reactions can happen at acidic conditions or basic conditions. Um, but determining what that mechanism looks like then um, is based on uh, knowing whether you're in acidic conditions or basic conditions. So. For instance, if we have water acting as a nucleophile for an ester, <clears throat> having water attack the carbonyl and breaking that to make a, um, a water molecule attached with a alkoxy ion right next to it, <coughs> excuse me, is very uphill in energy because you've got a very weak nucleophile and you're making a very strong base in terms of turning this into something with a negative charge. So that's a big jump in terms of transition state energy. However, if you have some acid around and you can protonate that carbonyl first, and then water can act as your nucleophile, it's a much smaller jump in terms of activation energy. So drawing these mechanisms, requires you to understand a little bit about the reaction conditions and when it's appropriate to add a proton transfer step. Um, and in general, it's going to be based around, do you have protons around? If you have protons around, you're probably going to start with the proton transfer step first. If you're not in acidic conditions, you can't start with the proton transfer step. So here are general rules for, the, for writing these mechanisms. In acidic conditions, we don't want to make a strong base. Makes sense, right? Because in, in acidic conditions, if you make a strong base, it's going to react with the acid to become protonated. If you're in basic conditions, we don't want to form a strong acid. So if you're in basic conditions, you don't want to make anything that's positively charged. 
positively charged generally means that, especially if it's if it's got a hydrogen attached to it and it's positively charged, that means it could give away that hydrogen, right? And act as an acid. So if you think of acids as being extra H pluses around and you think of basic conditions as missing H pluses, basic conditions, you're gonna see more negative charges. Acidic conditions, you're gonna see more positive charges. Right? You, if you're in acidic conditions, you shouldn't make a negative charge. If you're in basic conditions, you should not make a positive charge. Um, and this applies to all leaving groups and intermediates. You're, you need to be paying attention to that. And if you wind up drawing your mechanism and you wind up putting a negative charge, but you're in acidic conditions, that just means that you missed a proton transfer step first. It means you needed to protonate that leaving group before it leaves. Or you need to protonate the carbonyl oxygen before you break the carbon carbonyl bond. Right, and so, and going back, I'm gonna go back to this. Here's our two basic steps for, for ACL substitution. It's a nucleophilic attack and loss of leaving group, right? You make a tetrahedral intermediate with a nucleophilic attack, and then you kick off a leaving group to make your product. On, at any point, you can do a proton transfer step if it makes it so that you're going to only make um, the right forms of the intermediate. So you can do a proton transfer step at the very beginning before a nucleophilic attack. You can do a proton transfer step in between these two. And you can do a proton transfer step at the end. So uh, we've been kind of getting a little bit willy-nilly with proton transfer steps because we're getting the hang of, oh, well, there's just always some base around that can accept a proton, or there's always some proton source around that can give a proton. Now we're going to start being careful about drawing these mechanisms um, so that you have the ability to write in the proton transfer steps that you need. So for instance, if you're in basic conditions, you can have hydroxide attack a carbonyl because hydroxide is a base and it's a strong nucleophile and you wind up making this intermediate on the left. But if you're in acidic conditions, you have water as your nucleophile and you can't make this intermediate with a negative charge on it if you're in acidic conditions. So in acidic conditions, you have to protonate first and then have your nucleophile attack. Right, so the, the difference is, again, the difference is under basic conditions, you can make a negatively charged intermediate. Under acidic conditions, you can make a positively charged intermediate. Okay. So let's practice that. So if we're in acidic conditions, we have ethanol as our nucleophile. We have a methoxy group as our leaving group. What are the steps going to be to do this under acidic conditions? I'll give you guys a few minutes and then I'll write it out.
So Sean, this might be a half thought out idea, but is this our, is the ethanol the uh, solvent here? It, it's both the solvent and the nucleophile, yes. Okay, so then how, how do you measure acidity in alcohol? It gets tricky, right? Um, if you're not in a water-based solution, then calculating pH based on a pKa gets a little bit tricky. Um, so, and realistically, you would do something like um, you wouldn't use Ka because Ka is based around being having water be the the weak base um, for for a weak acid. Um, you would wind up having to combine some versions of Ka reactions. Remember how we used to add um, equilibrium reactions up, and then you can multiply their equilibrium constants and get things to cancel out. We would have to do something like that to predict a, an equilibrium constant for this reaction um, based on Ka's potentially. Oh, um, interesting. Okay, so there's kind of like a, yeah, you would add them or is it like more of a ratio? And so they kind of just cancel out. You would, if, you, if you're gonna add the reactions together, you would need to multiply the equilibrium constants for those reactions. Um, so remember that there were a couple of different ways we could manipulate those. If you, you know, if you flipped products and reactants, then you did one over your K value for that reaction. If you added reactions together, you multiplied your K values. Um, if you needed to change the stoichiometry, you had to square, you know, if you doubled your reaction coefficients, you needed to square your equilibrium constant. So there were, there were some rules. We can basically use those to get from Ka to an equilibrium constant for these for these other reactions where water is not the solvent. Um, it just takes a little bit of work since we're so used to that, but it's not it's not prohibitive. Um, and a lot of times you would if you were measuring the, the pH um, directly here. Uh, I don't know actually what we would do because you can't use just a pH meter if you're not in a um, water based solution because that throws things off. Um, so they probably have some more specialized equipment for measuring the pH directly, um, or you just do it on a theoretical level and, and combine your equilibrium reactions and do some number crunching. Gotcha. So it is as complicated as I thought. <laughs> it is. Things get complicated very quickly, and there's a reason why we don't do a lot of the math in OCHEM. Um, if you get to high, uh, you know, an upper division OCHEM class, um, then you might do some of that to predict what the pH would actually need to be for each of these so that you can you know, do things like numerically predict your reaction um, equilibrium constants. Um, but at this point, we're still just getting the basics down, so we're not going to worry about that too much. And if we're going to draw our mechanism here, if we, if we didn't protonate anything first, if we just had our our regular first step, ethanol acting as, as a nucleophile, we would wind up making an intermediate that looked like an oxygen with a negative charge. Um, and we can't have that in acidic conditions. So if we're in acidic conditions, we have to start by protonating My stylus is giving me trouble. We have to protonate the carbonyl oxygen first. So we do a proton transfer. And that's going to make an intermediate or our first intermediate that looks like this. So protonate the carbonyl, and now that carbonyl bond is weakened enough that we can have a weak nucleophile come in and attack it. So we'd wind up with an intermediate now that looks like this. 
So we didn't deprotonate the ethanol before it attacked. So that means that our ethanol still has its hydrogen attached. So then our next step, if we were ignoring pH, our next step would be the methoxy group leaves and we reform the carbonyl, right? We can't just have the methoxy group leave because then we'd be making a strong base, right? So we have to protonate the methoxy group before it can leave. So we're gonna have another proton transfer step and really two of them that you could draw at the same time. We're gonna protonate the, meth the methoxy group and deprotonate the, eth um, the ethanol group at the same time. You could draw it as two different steps, probably be more accurate to do it that way, but it starts being a lot of um, a lot of uh, steps. So we're going to protonate the methoxy group. We're going to deprotonate the ethoxy group. So proton transfer, nucleophilic attack, proton transfer again. Now our leaving group can leave. So our intermediate at this point is going to look like this. Now methanol can leave and we can reform our carbonyl. And then we have one more proton transfer at the end to deprotonate our carbonyl group. So that mechanism, the leaving group leaves is an easy step. And then at the same time, we can draw the carbonyl group reforming carbonyl bond. And we get our new ester plus methanol we just still have one extra H plus attached. So to get all the way to the final product that's shown, we still need to do one last proton transfer step. It should just look like that. And if it doesn't show you what the proton, proton source is, in OCHEM, we get a little bit sloppy, and we don't need to say that the H plus is going anywhere in particular, um, or that we don't need to say where the H plus is coming from on some of these proton transfer steps. It's more about knowing that there are protons around and adding them where we need to so that we don't make a negative charge anywhere. All right, so then our, our final product then. would be the, this would be ethyl propanoate. Went from methyl propanoate to ethyl propanoate. And these proton transfer steps can be tricky. I remember feeling a little bit paralyzed by how many possible places there were to protonate in that middle section, um, especially. The key with these is you need to keep it moving towards the product. Knowing the product that you're trying to get to is key here. Because if you, pro if you um, protonate the wrong spot, you're just gonna wind up making something. You're either gonna go with the reaction going in a different direction, either going backwards and making your, your reactant again, or you're gonna make something totally different. 
So having an idea of what the product should be, in this case, we're taking one ester and turning it into another ester, knowing what that other ester is, is key to knowing where you're supposed to protonate to keep the things moving along. Yeah, you could protonate over there, but that's not going to get you closer to where you want to go. Right? When you're trying to get from your house to the grocery store, everybody has their own optimal route based on where your house is and where you're going, right? Like, you know, if I'm trying to go to Rayleigh's the Y from my house, I have to turn right when I get to Pioneer Trail. I could go left. That's not getting me closer to where I want to be, though. Right. And so with these mechanisms, it can be. It's a little bit like those long conversion problems we used to do in Gen Chem 2, right, where you had to keep your eye on the ball, so to speak. And I'm mixing so many metaphors and analogies that I, even I'm lost, but um, keep your destination in mind. And that will help with these. Right? And so if I didn't give you your destination in this case, if you didn't know any of this, a lot of times it's, you've got to figure out the reaction first and then do the mechanism. If you know that, oh, okay, I've got an ester and it's reacting with an alcohol, that's going to make another ester. Then you can go through and do the mechanism a lot more easily. Trying to figure out the product by doing the mechanism works, but it takes a lot of practice and it's and it can be really hard until you see some of these um, general themes and really get a handle on them. And I'm sure I've mentioned this at one point or another, um, but that that is how I got myself the lowest score on a chemistry test that I saw before grad school in undergrad, the lowest chemistry test. Uh, lowest score on a chemistry test that I got was because I thought I could just do a mechanism to figure out the product. Um, and I went, I took a left turn instead of a right turn somewhere on most of my reactions. Um, so the mechanisms make it make sense, but don't rely on being able to just sort of feel your way to the product at this point. That comes later. All right. This is, yeah, this is the last, um, the last slide for today. Just more practice with these mechanisms. Um, if you're not sure if you're under acidic conditions or basic conditions, you have to look at your reactants, right? So. If it's explicitly said acidic conditions, if you've got H plus drawn, that means you're on, in acidic conditions and that simplifies things. That makes it really clear. If it's not explicitly shown, you have to read the room, so to speak. You have to look at what the other reactants are. For instance, NH3 is the protonated form of NH2 minus, right? So we're probably going to have to treat this as though it was in acidic conditions. If it said NH2 minus was my nucleophile, that's only going to exist under very basic conditions. So if it says the amide ion, you know it's basic conditions. If it says NH3, it's going to be under acidic conditions. And same over here, you have a deprotonated carboxylic acid as our nucleophile. Well, if it's deprotonated, that means you're in basic conditions. Because if it's acidic conditions, this would be the acid, not the deprotonated form. So basic conditions, acidic, and explicitly shown in this case, acidic. And in general, the basic conditions are going to be easier to draw. There are going to be fewer proton transfer steps because you have fewer protons around. 
right? You still need to make sure you don't make a product that is has a positive charge or an intermediate with a positive charge, but that's going to be easier to do um, with these nucleophilic substitutions. All right. Hey, Sean, I have a question yeah. about that. I'm not sure if I'm confused, but isn't that an acid anhydride on for A, and don't you not make acids in a basic condition? You don't make the acid, it's an acid anhydride. Um, which is different, okay. Which is different. The, the anhydride that has this whole group together, you make in basic conditions. Um, you can make them in acidic conditions too, it's just more steps. Um, but so it's any of our different functional groups, our acid derivative functional groups, we can make in either basic conditions or acidic conditions. It just changes the number of steps to get there. Oh, okay. I think I'm, it's more the intermediates than the, than exactly. that. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to give you guys. Um, let you guys work on these and we'll go through these mechanisms at the beginning of lab at one. Um, and so at least at least the basic one and try one of the acidic ones, even if you get lost halfway through, give it a try to make your um, your intermediates and do your steps there. Um, and then we'll go through this um, drawing these out at the beginning of lab at one o'clock. Any questions before we break for now? All right, then go for it. And I will see everybody at one o'clock or check the um, recording that I'll post later.